Carpe diem from a deconstruction point of view. Deconstruction is, among other things, a response to structuralism. The pairs of opposition that structuralism finds in texts are not neutral. They are hierarchical. Let's test it. Light, darkness, heaven, earth, day, night, right, left, sense, sensibility, soul, body, man, woman. Oops. One side of the pairs is invariably perceived as higher or more valuable than the other. What structuralism sees as pairs of opposition, deconstruction perceives as an hierarchical way of thinking. In the first column, we have the primary set of values, and to the right, we find the secondary set of values. Oh, drat it, I, I wrote the word left to the right, which might seem a bit contradictory. But the point is that you can find loads of Western literature in which this hierarchical way of thinking is present. And the underlying point is that I can't even write a simple list of things, a text which doesn't contradict itself. This text, as any text, deconstructs itself. You may agree or disagree, but let's try and see where deconstruction takes us. Let's look at Horace's Ode 1, 11. Any text suppresses by force anything that doesn't fit the structure that the text wants to present. And inevitably, the text breaks down from the pressure of what it tries to subdue. Now, where to find the crack in the shield? The eye initially silences his female conversational partner, possibly partner in other respects as well. He presents a thesis which he expounds and mitigates. The theme of suffering is replaced by enjoying. Petty becomes fruity, or carpe diem. There's rather a lot of emphasis on the final exhortation, which means that a lot of energy is invested in upholding the structure. A good bet is that the text breaks down where the text becomes ambiguous. Now sepias has a dual meaning. Have taste, meaning literally be tasteful, be delicious. And secondly, have good taste, have judgment, be wise. This is the kind of ambiguity you'll find used in workplays in comedy. I'll present an example from Plautus below this video. On the surface of the text, sapias means be wise. Wiener liquis means strain the wine. Why not Wiener Bibas, drink the wine? Nisbet and Hubbard, in the commentary, make a very good point of the text here. There are two ways of dealing with the residue of wine. The ideal way is to leave the wine standing and wait for the residue to settle. It takes some time, but you obtain the best quality of wine in this way. Straining the wine, however, provides the opportunity for immediate consumption. But the method has some bad side effects. Wiener liquis implies, don't wait for the residue to settle. Drink the wine now, because we don't know if we live to drink it later. Et spatio brevi spem longan reseces. Entertain a realistic hope of enjoyment here now. This is more or less what the text wants to say. Here comes what the text happens to say. Sapias, be tasteful, be delicious, get rid of all bitterness, and stop talking about your hopes for the future. The tone is now more persuasive than prohibitive, as it was in the beginning. The rhetoric has changed, and so has the project of the eye. In the first three lines of the text, the eye wants to secure the passivity of the woman, elegantly expressed through the final word of line three, petty. Now, in contrast to the debilitating winter, the eye of the text encourages enjoying life. The climax of the text is reached in the final line with the now proverbial carpe diem, pluck the present day, trusting minimally in the morrow, the content of which can be rendered, you can seize the now, but you cannot shape the future. 
This is the philosophical idea of general validity that the text wants to present. But again, there's an underlying meaning as well. Please remember that the topic of the conversation is not the fundamental condition of humanity, but rather the possible future relationship between one man and one woman. The final line is a comment on exactly that. Enjoy yourself now. Don't count on me, or anything else for that matter, tomorrow. A free translation, but not without basis in interpretation, runs. Lucanoi. Do the two of us have a future together? Lucanoi's boyfriend. If we're getting married, you mean? Well, you know, it's not for me to decide the future, is it? Besides, you shouldn't ask. Actually, it's forbidden to know what the gods have decided for you and for me, Lucanoi. And don't you try astrology. It's so much better to see what happens and accept that. Look at nature and learn. Winter winds are giving the Tyrrhenian Sea and its pumice shore a hard time. Whether this is your last winter or you have several yet to come, be a good girl, get rid of all the bitter residue, have some wine and please stop talking about your hopes for the future. We're wasting our time talking. Enjoy what is right in front of you. Let's party tonight, and let's part tomorrow. Lucanoi, sought you. The last line was a feminist interpretation. Ode 111 is not a didactic poem of Epicurean philosophy. It is rather a piece of rhetoric where the eye elegantly, with philosophical persuasion and with reference to religious beliefs, wiggles out of future commitment such as marriage. The hypocrisy of the text, perpetuated by centuries of interpreters and commentators, is, I hope, now evident.